and welcome to the Penguin Prof channel. Today I want to talk about what it means to be alive. There's going to be some really cool stories here about cells and how cells are the functional unit of life, kind of how we came to find that out. In the process, I'm going to talk about sperm, laws against sex outside of marriage, and the probable origin of the prohibition of masturbation. That's kind of some interesting topics, so let's get right to it. Um, some things are very clearly alive, but you may not have given a whole lot of thought to where these ideas about what is alive and what is not alive uh, come from. H how did we come to know that the penguins are alive but the ice isn't? Um, I had to throw some pandas in there because they're also black and white, so they're cool. You know, when you look at something like this, I mean, is this alive? Because most people, when they see them, they think they're stones. And in fact, they are alive, and we call them living stones. More properly, they're called lithops. They are native to um, Namibia and South Africa. But you can see that it starts to get a little confusing. And what about when you look at soil? I mean, soil doesn't, at first glance, appear to be alive. But if you have even a small hand lens, you're going to find lots of living stuff in there, like this planarian. So, as it turns out, the closer biologists could look at things, the more alive things they found. But it still made it very difficult to determine, you know, what makes something alive and, and where do live things come from? And are alive things fundamentally different in some way than non-alive things? And, you know, the discussion of what is alive goes way, way back, but certainly some of the earliest writings come from Aristotle on this topic. Of course, he wrote about a lot of stuff, Greek philosopher uh, who divided everything into two groups, the mineral kingdom, or things that were not alive, and the animal vegetable kingdom, which obviously were alive. Um, he also purported the idea of spontaneous generation, which states that alive things could come from non-living things. Uh, most famously, that mice could come from grain or bales of hay, because that's what people saw. People saw mice coming out of uh, hay and grain, and they must have thought, well, that's where they must come from. People observed that flies would come from rotting meat. So that was, you know, kind of the idea, and Aristotle was a, a, a big fan of this. you got to cut him some slack. I mean, he studied everything, you know, physics and metaphysics and poetry and music and linguistics and politics and government. So, you know, cut him some slack on this one, you know. He was allowed to get some stuff wrong. Vitalism was very popular back in the day, and this was the belief that the reason why living things are alive is because they had this magic element or a vital spark, which is what made them living. So there was this spark of life and sort of poof, you know, you were alive. Biologists were a big fan of this. Even chemists were fans of this. Jans Jakob Beschelius. Jans Jakob Beschelius. Oh, <laughs> thank you said it was all about this vital force, that basically this was the difference between organic compounds and inorganic compounds. And he said, as all chemists did back in the day, that organic compounds just could not be synthesized from inorganic compounds. The first compound microscope was actually called by its inventor an occhiolino, which is Italian for little eye. This was back in 1609. Who was responsible for that? Can you believe it? It was Galileo Galilei. A lot of people are very surprised because we associate him with mathematics and astronomy and philosophy, but in fact, he was also interested in things very small. Now, he didn't call it a microscope. That happened some years later, but he was the first one to actually build a compound microscope that became widely used. Now this guy, Anthony von Leeuwenhoek. Anthony von Leeuwenhoek. Thank you. He was a Dutch draper, so he worked with cloth, and he was interested in lenses um, in the beginning, mainly because he was looking at threads and cloth and things like that. And he started making hand lenses, and he started making devices to hold the lenses. And he actually made some pretty amazing microscopes. And he started to look at other things, things other than cloth. And he became uh, actually quite renowned for this. And in 1667, the Royal Society of London said, hey, would you use some of these microscopes of yours and take a look at some semen? 
So, I mean, what an invitation, as you might imagine. So, you know, you get some bubbly and uh, called over his wife, Cornelia, and um, there you go. He jumps out of bed and, uh, you know, you can only imagine what Cornelia must have been thinking at this point. But anyway, in his words, six beats of the pulse after I ejaculated, he says, he was putting his semen into a capillary tube where he saw a vast number of wriggling animacules rounded and with a long, thin tail. And he probably was seeing at about 275x, so probably something that looks like this. And uh, he said they moved like swimming eels. And, of course, this is what uh, a much better view of human sperm magnified a thousand times. Now, this is much greater magnification than what uh, Leeuwenhoek had. But I got to tell you, this discovery was outrageous. What you have to realize is that heredity, procreation, uh, development of the fetus, uh, these were for the most part unknown or at best really poorly understood in Leeuwenhoek's time. And all of a sudden there were all of these questions because he thought, well, what if the man is the source of all life? And he proposed that every sperm contained a human being. And if that's true, then what about God? And what about, I don't know, let's call them all those lost souls, you know, of the sperm that, you know, aren't used for procreation. Maybe this is where all the rules against masturbation came from. I mean, that would make sense. I mean, there are souls, for goodness sake. And the idea that, you know, sex is reserved not only for marriage, but for procreative functions only. The idea that man was the seed and woman was the incubator became very widely believed. And actually, the drawing of the homunculus, look at this, an entire human fetus drawn inside a sperm. The drawing is actually quite good. And if you look at fetal skulls, you see the accuracy of it. You see the fontanelle there at the top of the head. Um, and so forth. But uh, this became a very, very popular idea. So people start thinking about life in a completely new way. Someone else who was looking at all things small was an English scientist who studied all kinds of stuff in physics and chemistry and biology. He wrote a book, a Micrographia, which took off in 1665. And he gets credit for using the term cell for the first time in 1665. This comes from a Latin root, cella, meaning small room. We have in Latin the verb cellare, we have it in Italian too, which means to hide or conceal. And he says that he used the word cella or cell because these uh, little boxes, which he thought were cells, but are actually cell walls in cork, they reminded him of the cells that monks live in in a monastery. Meanwhile, while biologists were looking at living things with uh, more and more magnification, the, the chemists were hard at work too. And in 1828, there was a breakthrough. And for the first time, a molecule found in living organisms was made in the lab, and that was urea. This was done by a German chemist named Frederick Wöhler. Wöhler. Thank you. And what he did was he treated silver isocyanate with ammonium chloride. This was the first time that an organic molecule was synthesized in the lab. So that was a really big deal. And in fact, this is considered the birth of organic chemistry. Wuhler actually wrote to Bachelius, the Swedish chemist who was the big fan of vitalism, and said, I must tell you that I can make urea without the use of kidneys, either man or dog. This was really the final blow to vitalism. Um, and like I said, the birth of organic chemistry. So those of you that love Ochem, you can probably safely call Wuhler uh, dad. Adding to what the chemists were doing, there were three figures that came onto the scene and are responsible for cell theory. Schleiden was a German botanist, Schwann was a German zoologist, and Virchow was a German physician. And collectively, they came up with one of the foundation principles of biology. And the cell theory 
looks like this. All living things or organisms are made of cells and their products. Cells are the basic building units of life. And cells come from pre-existing cells. Uh, that last one was possibly plagiarized, but moving on. Modern cell theory incorporates uh, those ideas as well as a few more. Um, all metabolism and biochemistry occurs within cells. Cells contain hereditary information, which is passed on during cell division, and all cells are essentially the same in terms of chemical composition in organisms of similar species. Now, it turns out that as microscopes get better and better, we get more and more understanding of the nature of cells and of life itself. So if you go to a place like the White Cliffs of Dover, at first this may not appear to be anything biological, but in fact, if you have a microscope powerful enough, you see that most of the white material, which is actually calcium carbonate, comes from these little guys. Coccolithophores are in the group of nanoplankton. They're extremely small plankton. They're not really visible as anything other than a smudge under a light microscope. And you notice the scale bar here is two microns. That's unbelievably small, but you can see them with electron microscopes. So again, the smaller we go, the more amazing things we find. So microscopes, basically, you can classify in two ways. What interacts with the sample to make the image? Either light, and you have optical microscopes, or electrons, both scanning and transmission electron microscopy. Those started uh, development in the 1930s. The second question is, how is the image scanned? Either all at once or with a particular scanning point? So basically, optical microscopes, you have a light source and a series of lenses for magnification. Transmission electron microscopy, you're shooting beams of electrons through the sample. And scanning electron microscopy, you're actually bouncing electrons off the surface of a sample. Um, in order to do that, you actually have to coat the sample with a metal of some kind. And now we know that there are two fundamentally different groups of cells on the planet. One type of cell we call prokaryotic. These are cells that are very small. They have no nucleus and they have no uh, organelles of any kind. Um, they do have DNA and, and ribosomes, although the ribosomes are different than eukaryotic ribosomes. And basically all prokaryotes are bacteria, eubacteria and the archaea. These are the, are the archaebacteria. Basically, eubacteria are the types of bacteria that live in, in sort of normal environments. They live on us and in us and all around us. The archaebacteria live in really bizarre environments like, you know, petroleum seeps and sulfur vents and hydrothermal vents at the bottom of the ocean, things like that, places that most people aren't going to go. They're also considered to be the oldest of all living things on the planet, and they were most certainly our planet's first living cells. The other type of cells that we see are called eukaryotes. These are large, complex cells with lots of stuff inside. We find them in proteins, fungi, plants, and animals. And uh, we'll spend some more time talking about eukaryotic cells and all their different parts in another video. As always, I hope that was helpful. Thank you so much for watching the Penguin Prof channel. Please support by clicking like, share, and subscribe. Visit on Facebook, follow on Twitter. Good luck.